those vegan guys. Thank you. Well, hello there again, beautiful people. Um, it's the second part of the reading of Seneca on the shortness of life. Uh, it was just something new I thought I would try. Um, certainly helped me to actually read and take it in because I watched myself back. Well, listened. Um, and uh, yeah, it's... Um, I took more in. Uh, so I've never heard of it. Apparently there's this whole kind of school of um, stoic philosophy. So I'm going to carry on from where I left off, obviously. And uh, if you remember where I left off was, so he longed for leisure and as his hopes and thoughts dwelt on what he f on, on that he found relief for his labours this was the prayer of the man who could grant the prayers of mankind i shall continue when marcus cicero was cast among men like cataline and clodius and pompey and crassus some of them undisguised enemies and some doubtful friends when he was tossed about in the storm that st struck the state, he tried to hold it steady as it went to its doom. But at last he was swept away. He had neither peace in prosperity nor patience in adversity. And how often does he curse that very consulship, which he had praised without ceasing, though not without good reason. What woeful words he uses in a letter to Atticus when the elder Pompey had been conquered and his son was still trying to revive his defeated forces in Spain. Do you want to know, he said, what I am doing here? I am staying a semi-prisoner in my Tusculan village. Not Tuscan. Tusculan villa. He then goes on to bewail his former life, to complain of the present and to despair of the future. Cicero called himself a semi-prisoner, but really and truly the wise man will never go so far as to use such an abject term. He will never be a semi-prisoner, but will always enjoy freedom, which is solid and complete at liberty to be his own master and higher than all others. For what can be above the man who is above fortune? Mm. Livius Drusus, a bold and vigorous man, had proposed laws which renewed the evil policy of the Gracchi and he was supported by a huge crowd from all over Italy but he could see no successful outcome for his measures which he could neither carry through nor abandon once embarked upon and he is said to have cursed the turbulent life he had always lived saying that he alone had never had a holiday even as a child for while still a ward and dressed as a youth he ventured to speak to a jury in favour of some accused men and to acquire influence in the law courts with so much effect that, as we all know, he forced certain verdicts favourable to his clients. To what lengths would so precocious and ambitious not go? You might have known that such premature boldness would result in terrible trouble, both public and private. So he was too late in complaining that he had never had a holiday, since from his boyhood he had been a serious troublemaker in the forum. It is uncertain whether he died by his own hand, for he collapsed after receiving a sudden wound in the groin. Ooh. Some people doubting whether his death was self-inflicted, but no one doubting that it was timely. What did he do? Stab himself in the widget. It would be superb, superb, 
It would be superfluous to mention any more who, though seeming to others the happiest of mortals, themselves bore true witness against themselves by their expressed hatred of every action of their lives. Yet they did not change themselves or anyone else by these complaints, for after their explosion of words their feelings reverted to normal. Assuredly, your lives, even if they last more than a thousand years, will shrink into the tiniest span. Those vices will swallow up any space of time, the actual time you have, which reasons can prolong, though it naturally passes quickly, inevitably escapes you rapidly. For you do not grasp it or hold it back or try to delay that swiftest of all things, but you let it slip away as though it was something superfluous and replaceable. But among the worst offenders, I count those who spend all their time in drinking and lust. For these are the worst preoccupations of all. Other people, even if they are possessed by an illusory semblance of glory, suffer from a respectable delusion. You can give me a list of miserly men, miserly men, or hot-tempered men who indulge in unjust hatreds or wars, but they are all sinning in a more manly way. By the way, I'm reading this to you as I read it to myself in my head. I don't read in my own voice. I can't read it on any road. Forgot where I went here. suffer from a respectable delusion. You can give me a list of Mount Misley men or hot-tempered men who indulge in unjust hatreds or wars, but they are all sinning in a more manly way. It is those who are on a, on a headlong course of gluttony and lust who are stained with dishonour. Oh, and it's a nasty stain. Now it gets it out. Examine how all these people spend their time, how long they devote to their accounts, to laying traps for others or fearing those laid for themselves, to paying court to others or being courted themselves, to giving or receiving bail to banquets, which now count as official business. You will see how their activities, good or bad, do not give them even time to breathe. Finally, it is generally agreed that no activity can be successfully pursued by an individual who is preoccupied, not rhetoric or liberal studies, since the mind, when distracted, absorbs nothing deeply, but rejects everything, which is, so to speak, crammed into it. Living is the least important activity of the preoccupied man, yet there is nothing which is harder to learn. There are many instructors in the other arts to be found everywhere. Indeed, some of these arts mere boys have grasped so thoroughly that they can even teach them. But learning how to live takes a whole life and which may surprise you more, it takes a whole life to learn how to die. So, so many of the finest men have put aside all their encumbrances, renouncing riches and business and pleasure, and made it their one aim up to the end of their lives to know how to live. Yet most of these have died confessing that they did not yet know. Still, less can those others know. Believe me, it is the sign of a great man and one who is above you human error not to allow his time to be frittered away. He has the longest possible life simply because whatever time was available he devoted entirely to himself. 
None of it lay fallow and neglected, none of it under another's control. For being an extremely thrifty guardian of his time, he never found anything for which it was worth exchanging. So he had enough time. But those into whose lives the public have made great inroads inevitably have too little. Nor must you think that such people do not sometimes recognise their loss. Indeed, you will hear many of those to whom great prosperity is a burden, sometimes crying out amidst their hordes of clients or their pleadings in law courts or their other honourable miseries. A bit like uh, Britney Spears at the moment, trying to get out of her dad's control. Life's not changed. And we still haven't learned how to use it. It's impossible to live. Of course it's impossible. All those who call you to themselves draw you away from yourself. How many days has that defendant stolen from you? Or that candidate? Or that old lady worn out with buying her hairs? Hairs. Or that man shamming an illness to excite the greed of legacy hunters? beautiful construction <sighs> but that language were really like this you know colloquially or that influential friend who keeps people like you not for friendship but for display oh that's deep girl mark off I tell you and review the days of your life mark them off and review them it doesn't repeat it, I did. You will see that very few, the useless remnants, have been left to you. One man who has achieved the badge of office he coveted longs to lay it aside and thought it a great coup to win the chance of giving games. But having given them, he says, when shall I be rid of them? That advocate is grabbed on every side throughout the forum and fills the whole place with a huge crowd extending further than can be heard. But he says, when will vacation come? We can have a bleeding holiday. That were mine. Everyone hustles his life along and is troubled by a longing for the future and weariness of the present. But the man who spends all his time on his own needs, who organises every day as though it were his last, neither longs for nor fears the next day. For what new pleasures can any hour now bring him? He's tried everything and enjoyed everything to repletion. For the rest, Fortune can dispose as she likes. His life is now secure. Hmm. Nothing can be taken from this life and you can only add to it as if giving to a man who is already full and satisfied food which he does not want but can hold. So you must not think a man has lived long because he has white hair and wrinkles. He has not lived long, just existed long. <sighs> For suppose you should think that a man that had a long voyage or who had been caught in a raging storm as he left harbour and carried hither and thither, thither <laughs> and driven round and round in a circle by the rage of opposing winds, he didn't have a long voyage. Just a long tossing about. Said that, won't I? I am always surprised to see some people demanding the time of others and meeting a most obliging response. Both sides have in view the reasons for which the time is asked and neither regards the time itself. As if nothing there is being asked for and nothing given. They are trifling with life's most precious commodity, 
being deceived because it is an intangible thing not open to inspection and therefore reckoned very cheap in fact almost without any value am I even in focus thumbnail Scott Biggs sorry I'm not sorry I'm reading I'm reading my way and I'm sharing it with you and I'm glad that some of you have appreciated it people are delighted to accept pensions and gratuities for which they hire out their labor or their support or their services but nobody works out the value of time Men use it lavishly as if it cost nothing. But if death threatens these same people, you will see them praying to their doctors. If they are in fear of capital punishment, you will see them prepared to spend their all to stay alive. So inconsistent are they in their feelings. But if each of us could have the tally of his future years set before him, if we knew how long we had left as we can of our past years, how alarmed would be those who, who, who only saw a few years ahead and how carefully would they use them. And yet it is easy to organize an amount, however small, which is assured. We have to be more careful in preserving what will cease at an unknown point. But you are not to think that these people do not know how precious time is. They commonly say to those they are particularly fond of that they are ready to give them some of their years. And they do give them without being aware of it. But the gift is such that they themselves lose without adding anything to the others. But what they actually do not know is whether they are losing. Thus they can bear the loss of what they do not know has gone. No one will bring back the years. No one will restore you to yourself. Life will follow the path it began to take and will neither reverse nor check its course. It will cause no commotion to remind you of its swiftness, but glide on quietly. It will not lengthen itself for a king's command or a people's favour. As it started out on its first day, so it will run on, nowhere pausing to turning aside or turning aside. What will be the outcome? You have been preoccupied with while life hastens on. Meanwhile, death will arrive and you have no choice in making yourself available for that. Can anything be more idiotic than certain people who boast of their foresight? They keep themselves officiously preoccupied in order to improve their lives. They spend their lives in organizing their lives. They direct their purpose with an eye to a distant future, but putting things off is the biggest waste of life. It snatches away each day as it comes and denies us the present by promising the future. The greatest obstacle to living in is expectancy, which hangs upon tomorrow and loses today. You are arranging what lies in fortune's control and abandoning what lies in yours. What are you looking at? To what goal are you straining? The whole future lies in uncertainty. Live immediately. Listen to the cry of our greatest poet, who, as though inspired with divine utterance, sings salutary verses. Life's finest day for wretched mortals here is always first to flee. Ooh. Why do you linger? He means, why do you idle? 
If you don't grasp it first, it flees. And even if you do grasp it, it will still flee. You must watch time swift, swiftness with your speed in using it. And you must drink quickly as though from a rapid stream that will not always flow. In chastising endless delay, too, the poet very elegantly speaks not of the finest age, but finest day. However greedy you are, why are you so unconcerned and so sluggish while time flies so fast, extending months and years in a long sequence ahead of you? The poet is telling you about the day and about this very day that is escaping <clears throat> so can it be doubted that for wretched mortals, that is, the preoccupied, the finest day is always the first to flee? Old age overtakes them while they are still mentally childish, and they face it unprepared and unarmed, for they have made no provision for it, stumbling upon it suddenly and unawares, and without realising that it was approaching day by day. Just as travellers are beguiled by conversation or reading or some profound meditation and find they have arrived at their destination before they knew they were approaching it. So it is with this unceasing and extremely fast moving journey of life, which waking or sleeping we make at the same pace the preoccupied become aware of it only when it is over. If I wanted to divide my theme into different headings and offer proofs, I would find many arguments to prove that the preoccupied find life, sh find life very short. But Fabanius, unfortunate last part of his name Fabianus Fabianus Fa no it's Fabianus I was right oh dear but Fabianus who was not one of today's academic philosophers but the true old-fashioned sort used to say that we must attack the passions by brute force and not by logic that the enemy lines must be turned by a strong attack and not by pinpricks for vices have to be crushed rather than picked at still in order that the people concerned may be censured for their own individual faults, they must be taught and not just be given up for lost. Life is divided into three periods, past, present and future. Of these, the present is short, the future is doubtful, the past is certain. For this last one, it, the, for this last is the one over which fortune has lost her power, which cannot be brought back to anyone's control. But this is what preoccupied people lose, for they have no time to look back at their past. And even if they did, it is not pleasant to recall activities that they are ashamed of, so they are unwilling to cast their minds back to times ill spent, which they dare not relive if their vices in recollection become obvious. Even those vices whose insidious approach was disguised by the charm of some momentary pleasure. No one willingly reverts to the past unless all his actions have passed his own censorship, which is never deceived. The man who must fear his own memory is the one who has been amb ambitious in his greed, arrogant in his contempt, uncontrolled in his victories treacherous in his deceptions, rapacious in his plundering, and wasteful in his squandering. And yet this is the period of our time which is sacred and dedicated, which has passed beyond all human risks and is removed from fortune's sway, which cannot be harassed by want or fear of or attacks of illness, 
It cannot be disturbed or snatched from us. It is an untroubled, everlasting possession. In the present, we have only one day at a time, each offering a minute at a time, but all the days of the past will come to your call. You can detain and expect, inspect them at your will, something which the preoccupied have no time to do. It is the mind which is tranquil and free from care, which can roam through all the stages of its life. The minds of the preoccupied, as if harnessed in a yoke, cannot turn round and look behind them, so their lives vanish into an abyss. And just as it is no use pouring any amount of liquid into a container without a bottom to catch and hold it, so it does not matter how much time we are given if there is nowhere for it to settle. It escapes through the cracks and holes of the mind. The present time is extremely short. <clears throat> so much so that some people are unaware of it, for it is always on the move, flouting on in a rush. It ceases before it has come and does not suffer delay any more than the firmament or the stars whose unceasing movement never pauses in the same place. And so the preoccupied are concerned only with the present and it is so short that it cannot be grasped and even this is stolen from them while they are involved in their many distractions. I'm going to warn it right now. I think I am a stoic philosopher. I don't speak like this because it's not this time. I talk like Paul from Oldham. But the Times of Saturn done kitchen vlogs about people twittering their time away with anger and hate and, you know, um, obsessions with material possessions this is exactly the same line of thinking so it soothes me but it also horrifies me because it's like yeah we've known all this for a long time and people still don't change Ooh, you know what I mean I'll just read a little bit more and then uh, we'll pause it again. In a word, would you like to know how they do not live long? See how keen they are to live long. Feeble old men pray for a few more years. They pretend they are younger than they are. They comfort themselves by this deception and fool themselves as eagerly as if they fooled fate at the same time. But when at last some illness has reminded them of them, their mortality, how terrified do, do they die, as if they were not just passing out of life, but being dragged out of it. They exclaim that they were fools because they have not really lived, and that if only they can recover from this illness, they will live in leisure. Then they reflect how pointlessly they acquired things they never would enjoy and how all their toil has been in vain. But for those whose life is far removed from all business, it must be amply long. None of it is frittered away, none of it scattered here and there, none of it committed to fortune, none of it lost through carelessness, none of it wasted on largesse, none of it superfluous. The whole of it, so to speak, is well invested. So, however short, it is fully sufficient. And therefore, whenever his last days come, the wise man will not hesitate to meet death with a firm step. Do you know what? I, because I want this to be just a three-parter. So I'm going to read a little bit more. I hope you're uh, all right with that. Um, I'll just have a little break and I'll be back. Perhaps you want to know 
whom I would call the preoccupied. You must not imagine I mean just those who are driven from the law court only by the arrival of the watchdogs, or those whom you see crushed either honourably in their own crowd of supporters or contemptuously in someone else's, or those whose social duties bring them forth from their own homes to dash them against someone else's door, or those whom the praetor's auction spear I don't know how to say that word. It's the man who does that, that is auction spear. Spear occupies in acquiring disreputable gain, which will one day turn rank upon them. Some men are preoccupied even in their leisure, in their country house, on their couch, in the midst of solitude, even when quite alone. They are their, their own worst company. You could not call theirs a life of leisure, but an idle preoccupation. Do you call that man leisured who arranges with anxious precision his Corinthian bronzes, the cost of which is inflated by the mania of a few collectors and spends most of the day on rusty bits of metal, who sits at a wrestling ring for shame on us we suffer from vices which are not even Roman. Keenly following the bouts between boys, who classifies his herds of pack animals into pairs according to age and colour, who pays for the maintenance of the latest athletes. Again, do you call those men leisured who spend many hours at the barbers simply to cut whatever grew overnight, to have a serious debate about every separate hair, to tidy up disarranged locks, or to train thinning ones from the sides to lie over the forehead? Oh, comb overs have always been popular then. How angry they get if the barber has been a bit careless, as if he were trimming a real man. How they flare up if any of their mane is wrongly cut off, if any of his is badly arranged, or if it doesn't all fall into the right ringlets. Which of them would not rather have his, his country ruffled than his hair? Which would not be more anxious about the elegance of his head than its safety? Which would not rather be trim than honourable? Do you call those men leisured who divide their time between the comb and the mirror? And what about those talking about Instagram queens? And what about those who busy themselves in composing, listening to or learning songs while they distort their voice, whose best and simplest tone nature intended to be the straight one into the most unnatural modulations who are always drumming with their finger as they beat time to an, unim to an imagined tune, whom you can hear humming to themselves even when they are summoned on a serious, often even sorrowful affair. Theirs is not leisure, but indolent occupation. And good heavens, as for their banquets, I would not reckon on them as leisure times when I see how anxiously they arrange their silver. How carefully they gird up their tunics of their page boys. How on tenterhooks they are to see how the cook has dealt with the boar. Parsnip. With what speed smooth faced slaves rush right around on their duties. With what skill, meaning they were all kids really, that, isn't it? With what skill birds are carved into appropriate portions, how carefully wretched little slaves, come on now, wipe up the spittle of drunkards. By these means they cultivate a reputation for elegance and good taste, and to such an extent do their failings follow them into all areas of their private lives that they cannot eat or drink without ostentation? Without thinking they're fancy pants. I would also not. I, I would also not count as leisured those who are carried around in a sedan chair and a litter. 
and turned up punctually for their drivers as if it was forbidden to give them up. I don't know why that started. Let's do a couple of accents for fun. For the drivers, as if it was forbidden to give them up. Ooh. For the drivers, as if it was forbidden to give them up. For like their drivers, as if it was like forbidden to give them up. I'll carry on now. That was just a moment of me. Sorry. Lost my place. Who have to be told when to bathe or to swim or to dine. They are so enervated by the excessive torpor of a self-indulgent mind that they cannot trust themselves to know if they're hungry. I am told that one of these self-indulgent people, if self-indulgence is the right word for unlearning the ordinary habits of human life, when he had been carried out from the bath and put in his sedan chair, asked, Am I now sitting down? Do you think that this man, who doesn't know if he is sitting down, knows whether he is alive, whether he sees whether he is at leisure? It is difficult to say whether I pity him more than if he really did not know this, or if he pretended not to know. They really experience forgetfulness of many things, but they also pretend to forget many things. They take delight in certain vices as, as proofs of their good fortune. It seems to be lowly and contemptible men, man who knows what he is doing. After that, see if you can accuse the mimes of inventing many details in order to attack luxury. In truth, they pass over more than they make up and such a wealth of incredible vices have appeared in this generation, <laughs> which shows talent in this one area that we could now actually accuse the mimes of ignoring them. To think that there is anyone so lost in luxuries that he has to trust another to tell him if he's sitting down. So this one is not at leisure and you must give him another description. He is ill or even he is dead. The man who is really at leisure is also aware of it. But this one who is only half alive and needs to be told the positions of his own body. How can he have control over any of his time right that was quite a long one <laughs> my battery went and everything yet on I carried very very interesting uh, reading and very uh, interesting the kind of um, parallels uh, just kind of I suppose proving that you know um, unless we as humans and I talk about this a lot analyse ourselves and what we're doing and how it helps and how we help ourselves in the way we think and feel and react to the world we live in if, we, if we're not doing that constantly are we living? are we really living? it's very interesting it's very interesting field of thought and I like the way that Seneca writes obviously because it's you know he writes beautifully beautifully constructed uh, sentences and uh, um, analogies and and you know hypotheses uh, and examples um, so yeah uh, the next one will also be a long one I think I did about 13 pages then <clears throat> and there are 30 odd yeah so the next one might be another long one and I'll finish that off um, and if this is not a popular little three part thing on the um, channel doesn't matter some of us have enjoyed it and uh, thank you for coming along with me as I read um, Seneca on the shortness of life life is long if you know how to use it 
Uh, thanks for joining me. Speak to you again very soon. Until then, please be excellent to yourselves and each other. Bye, loves. <laughs>